If you've taken computer science classes or spent time studying for coding interviews, or honestly even just watched some YouTube videos on coding, there's a pretty good chance you've learned a bit about performance and big O notation. But unfortunately, what I find a lot is that a lot of beginners and just people with less industry experience tend to be misusing this information a lot and oftentimes just completely misunderstanding what exactly it means and what its purpose actually is. So here we have this chart that you might have seen before, the big O complexity chart. If you've never seen this, essentially what it represents is on the Y axis here, we have the number of operations. So you can think of this sort of like how long something is going to take, but it's not an exact time representation. It's just how many things are we going to have to do? And then down here in the X axis is the number of elements. So what is the input size? And we have different functions here. So for example, O of N here in the yellow is sort of considered like a standard function. This would be looping through all of the elements. So say you have an array and you loop through that array, it is going to be O of N because we're going to do one thing for each element in that array. We see each thing one time. And this sort of represents Represents an upper bound for what we call the time complexity. But do note that this is not an exact measurement. For example, if we say iterate through the entire array two times instead of one time, we would still call that O of n. We wouldn't say it's 2n because we go through the array two times. We don't get super specific like that. We just say it's O of n or a linear time function because the number of operations is going to grow proportionately with the number of elements. And then we can see we have some worse ones. For example, O of n squared is going to be much worse, especially as you get more elements. You can see this is sort of a quadratic function. And of course, we have some that are much better. So down here at the very bottom, we have O of 1. And O of 1 means that no matter how many elements you get, the number of operations is not going to scale with that input size, or potentially there is no input at all. So a function that does not care about an input size is going to be O of 1. And you'll see even on this chart, we use the different colors for horrible, bad, fair, good, and excellent. So naturally, as we write code, we try to get things down here in O of 1 or O of log n. And if you're curious, log n typically is functions where the input size is going to be half each iteration. So something like binary search, where we take the whole input size, and then we just take half of it, and then the next time we take half of it again, that is going to be a logarithmic function, which is actually going to be a very, very fast function. Or at least the time complexity is going to imply that it's going to be very fast. However, I do think that oftentimes Big O is a little bit overly academic and it's being misused a lot. So let's talk through some examples. So this is a website called JSBench and essentially it allows you to test different JavaScript code against each other and see which is going to be more performant. And it's worth noting that this is not looking at Big O notation. It is not doing asymptotic analysis. It's actually just running the code and seeing how long it takes. So up here we have some setup. And in this example, we are creating an array with 100 elements in it. And we just make each element be a zero. And here we have an O of n function. So it is going to loop through the entire array and just do i plus one to make sure something is happening here. And here we have an O of n squared function. So we loop through the entire array, but then we have this nested loop inside and that loops through the array again. So the number of times we actually iterate through the array is going to be n squared. And you can see this is actually 99% slower than this code. So this code did 28 million operations per second, and this one did 236,000 operations per second. So sort of the key takeaway here is, okay, O of n squared code is much, much slower. It's worth noting that in this example, Either one is probably actually fine in most scenarios. If you're writing JavaScript code, you're probably writing code for the front end of some website that's going to run on the client. And something that we can do 236,000 times per second is actually probably still completely fast enough and it's going to be completely negligible in most cases. But just generally speaking, we usually want to avoid nested loops because they give us these n squared time complexities that are much, much slower. And this makes sense because here we do 100 operations and here we do 100 squared operations. So 100 times 100, which is going to be 10,000. But this is where big O notation starts to break down just a little bit. So here we have the exact same example. So the same setup code and array with its size 100 and this code that loops through the array and this is O of n but this code is actually O of one. So this code does not use the array. What it does is it just loops from zero to 100. And this is O of one because 100 is a constant. It's just a number. There is no input size. There's nothing to scale with. There's no elements that we are caring about. This isn't using this array at all. So because of that, this code is technically considered O of one. We would say it's O of 100, which is equivalent mathematically to O of one. 
But practically speaking, these are essentially the exact same. So we can see they both did 28 million operations, which makes sense because they both simply iterated from zero to 100. They did effectively the exact same thing. So this is a case where you might say, okay, O of one code could actually be the same as O of n code. But if say this array had 1000 elements in it and we ran this again, you'll see, well, now this is doing much more work than this one. So the O of n code is going to be much, much slower than this O of one code. So you can see with this finished, we have 90% slower. But if say we made the array simply 10 elements, well, now the O of n code can actually end up being faster than the O of one code because the O of n code is just doing less total operations. So we can see 210 million operations per second and this one does 27 million operations per second. And it's considering an operation to be running this entire code. But when I say it does less operations, what I mean is simply that this code itself is simpler than this code. It requires less work. So the basic takeaway from this example is simply that just saying that something is O of n does not necessarily mean that it is going to be slower than something that is O of one. Of course, if the input size gets large enough, eventually that O of n code will be slower than O of one, right? If the input size is a billion, this is going to be slower in pretty much every circumstance. However, oftentimes we don't have input sizes that are that large. And you can actually see this if we go back to the big O complexity chart. Down here at the very bottom, when the number of elements is very small, they're all sort of grouped up together. And the time that something's going to take when we have a small input size is not necessarily going to align with this big O notation. Something that's even n squared could end up being much faster than something that's O of one in some circumstances. So this is an example that actually prompted this entire video. This is something I showed in a previous video. A lot of people were saying that my solution was less efficient and that that was a problem. And in some ways they were correct, but I actually think it's just a misunderstanding of how to use big O notation as well as a misunderstanding of sort of when performance matters and when it doesn't. So here we have some setup that just says let x equal c. So we just create this variable and this was the original code. So we check if x is a, b, or c, and if it is any of those, we just do something. And then we have this code, which I mentioned for a few reasons I actually think is going to be easier code to maintain in the long run. That's not the point of this video, but the idea here is simply that we create an array of those options and we check if the options includes x. And then we just do the same thing of just one plus one. And then down here is something a lot of people were suggesting. They were saying, well, this code was originally O of one. And once we do this options that includes, we are iterating through this options array. So this is actually O of n. And a lot of people were saying, well, instead you should use a set because look up in a set. So set dot has is going to be O of one. So this code is the same as this code, but a lot of people were saying, well, this one's O of one and this one is O of n. And I think there's a few different key misunderstandings here. And the first of those is that I would actually argue this is O of one code based on the context that was given in that video. So we have this options array and it has three values in it. And nothing else can ever be added to this array. There wasn't any circumstance where it was going to get extremely, extremely large. It simply represented this if check. So it doesn't really make sense that this would ever have millions of things in it. And we can also see that the options are simply letters. And we know that there's only 26 letters in the alphabet, or even if we considered all of Unicode, it would still simply be O of one because there is a maximum size to that. It is still considered a constant in big O notation. But big O notation aside, they are correct that looking up a value in a set is faster than looking up a value in an array. However, you'll see that both of these options were much slower than this code, but this code was actually a little bit faster than this code. So the set option was actually slower. So why is this? Well, it is because creating a set was actually the most expensive part of this entire thing. However, with all that said, I would argue that it doesn't matter at all. Now, of course, there are times when you need to get every little bit of performance out of some code. If you're doing something very low level, maybe you're working on an operating system, something like that, it's going to matter a lot. However, if you're writing JavaScript, almost 100% of the time, you are not in one of those scenarios. If you're writing JavaScript for the front end, so like the front end of a website, it's going to run on the user's browser. And I can't think of any scenario where for each individual user, we're going to need to do something that we can do tens of millions of times per second. It's just not something that's realistic when we're building a website. So even if it's 90 or even 99% faster, it might actually be completely negligible and make no real difference for the end user. And that's not to say that performance just doesn't matter at all on websites because it absolutely does. But 
most performance gains are not going to come from small little micro optimizations in your code, which oftentimes are not even actual optimizations. And if you actually benchmark them are not actually going to be faster. For example, if you created a thousand different sets, which there's no reason that you would be doing that, that would probably still be less of a performance hit than one extra trip to the server, one extra trip to some database. These are the things that actually matter and make large performance differences, whereas these tiny micro optimizations in very specific circumstances can matter, but most of the time you're just sacrificing maintainability of your code in exchange for basically no actual change. And I did mention things like this in the comments of that original video, and a lot of people mention things about how, well, this might be fine in one circumstance, but what if you need to do this thing a bunch and a bunch of times? So for example, here we have this array with 100 values again. We're doing basically the same thing as before, but now we're doing it in a for loop. So we are looping through that array and we're doing these same checks. And yes, this code is much slower and the set code is a little bit better and this code is much faster than all of the other code. But again, I would argue that most of the time this doesn't matter because first of all, what is the scenario where you need to do something like this 100 times in JavaScript? And second of all, in that scenario is 723,000 operations per second not enough for you? Because in every piece of JavaScript code I've written in my entire life, that would be perfectly fine and it's not going to be a performance bottleneck. So just try to avoid prematurely optimizing things that don't need to be optimized and when you do find that you have some bottleneck in your code, then go benchmark things and figure out what's actually going to be faster and what you can actually do to improve the user experience rather than just choosing random things to try to optimize when you're not really making the code any better. You're just probably making it less readable and less maintainable. And if you are curious as to why I said I prefer this options array, even though it is much less performant, you should watch this video next on pro versus beginner code.